Hi guys, this week, um, this week's episode is stemming from a question that someone asked on a forum. They said, um, what business knowledge or what business skills does a writer need? So I've thrown a few things together. There's going to be a, a diagram up here, which shows the like a Venn diagram for audience, producer, and genre, and some little sub areas around that for us to consider in this conversation. The first thing I want to get across is what I call the Nike paradigm. Nike doesn't sell to us. Nike sells to shoe shops, but they have to make a product that we want. So shoe shops desire to buy it off Nike to sell to us. In that paradigm, we have to write a screenplay for the audience that will attract a big enough audience that the producer will want to buy it off us. Producer, studio, streamer, person with money wants to buy it off the writer. So that's the Nike paradigm. We're not writing something for the end user. We are writing something for the person who will service the needs of the end user. So got to keep that in mind. If you write just for a producer, you may miss out the, a true opportunity. Um, I've been watching Masterclass. It's really good. Um, Chris Voss, negotiator, bits on yoga, healthy cooking. I'm a vegetarian. Some good uh, yottams on there. Uh, some very good stuff. But in part of it, I was watching um, Hans Zimmer, the um, composer. And he said when he was in a band touring around England, in, in Thatcher's England, there was a lot of, if you're in the big cities, you're wealthy. As soon as you went outside the cities into the smaller towns and villages, life was very, very hard. Unemployment was high. People were working exceptionally hard to, to make ends meet. And he created this character in his head that he calls Doris. Doris, as he puts it, is a woman of a certain age who has two boys. They're a nightmare. She works very hard to put food on the table. And at the end of the week, she's got just a few dollars left. She could choose to stay home and watch TV, or she's going to take that just few dollars that she spent all her time to have and buy a movie ticket. You have to do your very best for Doris. That's how Hans thinks about this. He could write a, I mean, he's a great composer. He could write a good piece of music, but is it the very best he could do for Doris? If you go back to that Nike paradigm, we've got to write something that's the very best for that audience, but make it attractive for the producer, make it livable. So you've got that moral objective for Doris, but you've also got the business need. We're going to talk about a bit about the business need today. So let's look at the audience first in the diagram. How dev devoted is that audience to the genre that you're writing? How big is the audience for that genre? Some genres like horror aren't Harry Potter. They're not massive audiences, but they're a constant. They're always there. You will always have a horror audience because it's a very, very old sort of genre. If you think about some of the very early stories, um, the Odyssey or anything like that always has like an evil beast that has to be beaten or destroyed. And there's that sense of fear. So if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, once you get past food, water and somewhere to sleep, the next one is security. And fear or horror is a threat to your security. So it's a very base level emotion. So that's why horror is a constant. It's easy for people to understand. It's, it's universal. Something is scary, whether it's in... Um, Korean, German, Russian, English, or French. It doesn't, scary things are scary things. That's why um, there's a lot of great Japanese horror, which is remade for an English audience, because it's horror is universal. But how big is your audience? How rusted on are they? How much do they love that genre? I write a bit of crime. People come and go from crime. Some crimes are good. Some crime stuff is really popular. But it's not a rusted on genre. People like crime, they're not fanatical about crime. People that like uh, fantasy, like the Game of Thrones crowd, 
that they're really, really um, rusted on. They love those sorts of fantasy things. Lord of the Rings, A Hobbit, uh, The Game of Thrones, uh, The Last Empire, Vikings, that swords and hack and slash crowd. They're really big. They're really rusted on. So that's a bigger sort of genre. So look at the genre. Look at the audience. You've got the overlap there. How big are they? How rusted on are they? If you're servicing an audience that is quite fanatical, you'll probably be in a slightly busier marketplace. So it won't be as easy to be heard or seen, but you've got a good audience. Now, the producers for that genre, um, they'll know how profitable it is. So they'll know how much they can spend. If they look at your film and it's a massively expensive film, one rule of thumb, this is one of the probably the only rule in screenwriting, a lower budget is always best. You can always spend more. You can always hire more people. I had that in a, in a script. Um, they'd auditioned a guy. They loved him. They said, can you, can you give him a part? Can he be in this shot? Could you reposition this person to be in a group of people with one extra person. So I saw him. He was a really nice guy. He was very funny. He had great delivery. So I said, do you mind if I write him a few lines? And at the end of um, this conversation, this character clarified with him, what, what did you just get out of that? What I got out of that? And they got to have a few lines. Very funny little scene. He was a really good actor. They could expand, they could afford to pay, and they could afford to put an extra scene in. You can always expand. But if that was a pivotal scene and somebody said, can you take it out? Oh, okay, well, we've got the transfer of information. Where can I put the information? What have we learned? There's a, a change in power. Are those two scenes, the two scenes, if we take that scene out of the middle, is this guy in charge the entire time? We need him to have a dip. Uh, what, how does it affect the pacing? There's a lot more effort going the taking out than adding in. It's like trying to remove salt from a meal. You can't do it, but you can always add a bit more. Um, so you've got the producer. They all know how much budget you've got and less is more. So if they say to you, we need to cut, don't stand on your digs and say, yeah, I know. You have to get an understanding for the profitability. This is something that you have to understand as a business person. You have to know how big your audience is, how rusted on they are. How much is that audience worth? Do they ever watch things on streaming? Are they a, a downloader type audience? Or are they going to go to cinema? Is there a potential for a theatrical release? This is all part of your knowledge that you have to understand from a business point of view. How is your product going to get in the hands? How is Nike going to get that shoe under a foot of a person over there? You have to understand this. So when your producer starts giving you stuff, you have to listen. They also have experience and understanding of your audience. If they say, that's not going to fly, you can't stand on your digs and say, no, that has to stay. If they say, we've never had a character like that before, and the reason why we've never had a character like that before is like we've never had a wooden spaceship because they burn up on re-entry. You say, no, 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 I definitely want to have this next space shuttle made out of cedar. Don't be an idiot. It's not going to work that way. Um, also, when you think of your audience, is it growing? Is it shrinking? Is it constant? Horror audiences are a constant. If it's just starting to get a little bit of traction, you're maybe five years too late. But if you think, okay, Westerns, 10 years ago, um, when I first started writing, everyone said, what's the best bit of advice? You never write a Western. I guarantee now in the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot of Westerns. We're going to see a lot of good Westerns and we're going to see a lot of really badly, quickly written Westerns or people that have bought a Western, which isn't very good. And we're going to modify it and get it in. But it's a Western. Um, that's what you have to understand. That look at something that isn't popular at the moment, but you can see it coming back in. Look at the world around it. Would people like to see these sorts of stories? If you want to write something on spec, I write that. I'm always writing crime. One day crime will be like flare jeans. It'll come back into fashion again. At the moment, yeah, it is, it isn't, whatever. That's what I write. So the other thing you've also got to understand about business is a lot of people don't understand the idea of like selling a screenplay. When they buy it, they own it, right? You don't own it anymore. It's sold. It's done. When you buy a steak in a restaurant, the chef doesn't come out and tell you how to chew it. It is theirs. It's your steak. It's their story. You can work with them to make it something they really want. And the reason they buy it is because you identified the audience and you gave Doris what she needed. By giving Doris what she needed, the producer is going to buy it and make it. The other thing you have to understand about business 
is that you're in a push market, not a pull market. There's not a demand. People aren't coming into shops and saying, have you got a copy of Trivial Pursuit? That's what that Trivial Pursuit came out, whenever it came out in the 80s, maybe late 70s, and it was an instant hit. So a person would go into shop A, do you have Trivial Pursuit? No, you don't. Do you have Trivial Pursuit? No, you don't. No, you don't. Six shops suddenly went, wow, we've got to get a, a copy of Trivial Pursuit because there's a demand. So they all rang up the distributor, give us a copy of Trivial Pursuit. The distributor's like, I need six copies. So he rang up the manufacturer, give me 10. Suddenly, within six months, there was an oversupply of Trivial Pursuit. It went from being a very expensive game, like $25, $50 a copy, to, you know, they were giving it away. You buy anything, you get a copy of Trivial Pursuit. So then they did what they normally do, change cha change versions. You have the history version, the kids version, the, the Genesis version, whatever. They diversify. This will happen in a genre as well. There's be a bit of a, a pull. There'll be a lot of appetite for westerns, so you'll have to diversify around a western. Maybe look at things around the outside. This is how products work. They release a fridge. Everyone's got an internet-driven fridge. Then I'll start introducing colors. Same as cars. We have custom colors. We have custom wheels. And then they boom, remove that model and bring the new model out. The new model's basic. And then I start adding things in, leather interior, sports, packs, change. When you start seeing lots of little features coming into a car, you know it's going to run out soon. They're not going to be doing that model. It's a bit like a genre. When they start doing lots of little changes to it, it's starting to lose pace. It's not as popular as it was. It's beginning to tailor off. So think of yours that as well. If you see a genre over there and you want to write it, think of how you can start adding the mag wheels and the leather interior and the sports pack diversify that genre a little bit. That's when people say there's a crossover in genres. That is possible and it works sometimes. The other thing you've got to do is give people a completed package. Okay. A screenplay is a document. It's not a movie. The document, it goes from paper to performance. So when a person's reading your document, they've got to see the performance that they would imagine in their head. So your screenplay has to be as complete as possible. It has to have things like, you know, he says it laughingly, or all those things that people go, oh, don't tell an actor how to act, don't tell the director what to do. That has to be a complete document. Once it's a complete document, people can see it as a film and they go, I don't agree with what Craig's written. I know how I'm going to do that. I wouldn't do that that way, I'll do that this way. Same as when you, you know, read a recipe book or or you see, you say, no, no, I, I'm going to use tofu instead of fish, whatever it happens to be. You can modify it, but you can see the basics, the bones, the skeleton. If it doesn't name the protein, you don't know what the, the is it a fish meal, a steak meal, a chicken meal, a pork meal, a tofu meal. Um, it has to be mentioned and you can make up your own mind. Same thing, you have to give people a performance. You have to give them a completed story. And when they take it to performance, they'll change it. And once it's gone to performance, then they'll make it to a product. They'll edit it. They'll add a soundtrack. They'll package it up and it'll go off into the world into exhibition, wherever that happens to be. But you have to be complete in your first thing, which is the document. Um, I was going to do this at the beginning. Jim Boston. Um, Jim has a YouTube channel. Jim, I would have left a comment on your channel, but you don't have comments turned on. Um, he left a comment. We had a bit of a chat. And I also know Jim over from the Stage 32 uh, forum. And I went and looked at his YouTube channel. And he plays piano on his YouTube channel. It's just plain and simple. He doesn't get there and prattle on like I do. He just gets there, walks in, sits in an upright piano, and knocks out some piano playing sort of jazz tunes. I wasn't 100% sure what the tunes were. That's probably a, a hole in my musical understanding. But thanks for the comment, Jim. And I was enjoying. I've listened and I've liked a lot of your stuff. They're, they're good songs. So if you want to hear some good upright piano playing, nick over uh, Jim Boston. I'll we'll leave a link in the uh, things below. Head over to forums, talk to people, listen to people, get notes, all those sorts of things. Like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that. And until next time, guys, keep writing. Bye.